I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-13, Wednesday, January 6th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News, and it's early, but it seems like 2021 is not going to be a complete dumpster fire. I second that, Joe. Congratulations on all of us making it through 2020. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable and as of today, we're anxiously awaiting the results of the final U.S. Senate race. Um, looks like the voting is razor thin. And speaking of razors, Joe, that's quite a look for you today. What, you mean my hair or my beard? Actually, like, you look well coiffed. I mean, did, did, you, did you trip and fall into an electric razor or something? You're, you're, looking, uh, you're looking stylish. The TDM Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland January, horses of all ages sale takes place Monday, January 11th through Thursday, January 14th. That's next week. Visit january.keeneland.com for more details on the sale, which features the dispersals of Samsung Farm, Paul Pompa Jr. and Spry Family Farms. Okay, so we were not on the air to, uh, to, recap, to recap and react to the Malibu and a couple other big stakes um, over the break. I think the two, the two headliners clearly are, are Charlatan and Life is Good from the races that we weren't able to cover the last few weeks. Um, Charlatan, I was, I was against him in that race. I thought, you know, coming off that long layoff, I had watched some of his works on XBTV and they just, they, they didn't seem to have quite have the same pop that, that he had in the spring, but... You know, I was I was proven wrong. He he blew by Nashville like he was standing still and ran away in the stretch. One eased up by about five and a half lengths, I think, got a one hundred seven buyer. Um, and I think we we can we can agree that he's he's the most exciting horse of, of twenty twenty one at this moment, especially with a couple of recent retirements. Um, I, I think you know this the sky is the limit for him. I wonder how far he ultimately wants to go. Um, he has not been proven beyond a mile and an eighth, and you could argue that his uh, his worst race so far was the mile and an eighth Arkansas Derby, even though he won by six lengths. He only got a 96 buyer field. Field wasn't too good. That was obviously the weaker division of the Arkansas Derby last year. But, you know, at least going seven furlongs or a mile, I don't I don't see anybody on the scene right now who can beat him. It's really just a matter of him staying healthy. Um, but he's it was it was an incredible, incredible performance in the Malibu. Um, and then Life is Good, who ran in the sham on Saturday, you know, I said this, at, we were talking about Life is Good's uh, maiden win. I said that he seemed maybe a little bit too fast for his own good. He seemed like a little bit of a runoff speed. And I think that that bore out in the uh, in the sham. He's, you know, he still ran a big race. He got a 101 buyer, um, but he was he was getting a little like weary late. He ran off and, and ran some really quick fractions. Um, I don't know. I just, I got to, I, I, I got to be against him especially if he keeps, you know, if he keeps running like this, if he keeps having these runoff races, I got to be against him as, as the distances get longer. It was, it was crazy when they had the first Derby future wager pool and he was like the only horse in single digits. He was like something ridiculous, like eight to one, even essential quality was like 18 to one. So I got to be against him going forward, but obviously he's got a lot of talent. I just think in the future, his, his best races are going to come around one turn. Uh, just some thoughts from you guys about those two performances and anything else you saw. Yeah, and Joe, nothing really to add about Charlatan. I mean, everything he said, I totally agree with. Uh, he's a very, very exciting horse. It'll be very interesting to see where they go with him now. Will they go to the Pegasus? Will they entertain thoughts of going to Dubai or Saudi Arabia? Or that sort of thing. But yeah, until proven otherwise, he's going to be the most exciting biggest horse 2021 uh life is good i don't really know what to make of him and one of the reasons why is i'm I'm having a flashback i think a lot of people are to authentic who won the same race and there are some similarities there that you know life is good looks green looks like he still needs to learn and you had that same thing last year with authentic and i was one of the first guys to say all authentic will never go a mile and a quarter etc so i'm a little bit gun shy to do any say anything negative about life is good so let's just look at the positives uh the buyer number was really good and maybe this horse that finished second behind him medina spirit just ran out of his skin i mean they did have 13 lengths back on the third place finisher Yes, I think life is good is going to go forward. 
Do I think he's a cinch to win the Kentucky Derby? Of course not. We have to see more. And yes, you would like to see him run a little bit uh, of a more settled race where, you know, he's not running 44 and change or something like that. But uh, I think he passed the test and I'll be anxious to see what he does in his next race, which would likely be the San Felipe. And I think when you watch these two races, you have to remember, um, you know, something, and that is both horses are still lightly raced and still unseasoned. Um, so it's really not a surprise that that life is good, who that was only his second start of his career, um, is still kind of le- we're learning about him. He's learning about how to race, maybe how to rate a little bit and maybe has some upside. And Bill, you're a thousand percent correct. I think we all learned a really difficult lesson with Authentic last year, um, all the way through, you know, midway through his three year old year where we kept poo pooing him and saying, ah, he can't go further. He can't go further. Um, when in reality, obviously he did. And, you know, who, no one's to say that life is good is as good as authentic. Um, but certainly you have to give, you know, these young horses a little bit of time to kind of learn their craft and learn what to do. And then we can get a better idea of, um, you know, how they're going to unfold as they develop in, uh, you know, in their three-year-old year. Again, this was only a second start of his career. Um, and it was a, it was a really impressive one. He was, you know, getting a little uh, leg weary at the end. Um, but that's not unusual for, you know, for a horse that runs long for the very first time. Um, flipping ahead or flipping back, I should say, to the Malibu, um, you know, I remember looking at the field and even commenting on the podcast about how, hey, this is a great race uh, on paper. Um, you have uh, Independence Hall, who was, you know, the the, the first or second choice in, in um, you know, a lot of his races as a two-year-old and early three-year-old, um, including some of the Derby preps, Collusion Illusion, who, who won the uh, Big Crosby, which was a great one, Thousand Words, the million dollar horse who, you know, won his first three starts. Nashville, who I was on the big, you know, I still am on the Nashville um, bandwagon, um, you know, running a hole in the wind during all three of his first starts. And then you have, oh, by the way, Charlton, who was, who was, you know, technically undefeated um, and Express Train, um, who finished second in the race. And uh, it just turned out to be a very, you know, very well run race for, you know, for the six horses that were in there, they were all very deserved. So I was impressed when Charlton ran the way he did with, uh, you know, winning the way he did and running a 107 buyer. And, you know, the seven furlongs, one turn mile is probably going to be his, uh, you know, his, his sweet spot. Um, Nashville, you know, no excuse other than, you know, maybe you say, okay, he ran three times back to back to back very quickly um, on all the big race days. And then they shipped them across country, uh, you know, to run in California, but the majority of these horses shipped across country to, to run, uh, you know, in, in this race. So, you know, you don't like to give him that kind of an excuse, but I'm still a, a Nashville fan. I'm still looking forward to him sprinting and, and running, you know, keeping it at three quarters um, for most of this year. Um, and, and, you know, it would be interesting to see if they would ever turf him being that he's a spice town of a mizzen masked mare. Um, you would wonder, Hey, maybe he, he would, you know, could he get better on the turf? Um, that would be a question that I would like to see answered in, uh, in 2021. A couple other things from that race. You mentioned Express Train, who I thought ran really well to be to be second in there. Um, I think he's an interesting horse going forward, uh, kind of a late developing three year old. Um, Nashville, you know, I don't know what conclusion to draw from that race with him. Now, do you just throw it out, or do you, do you you know dock him points for that because he gave it up? Like I understand the fractions were, were very very fast but he gave it up with no resistance at all. Like by the top of the stretch, he was toast. Um, and I say that as someone who leaned on Nashville more so because I was against Charlton in that race. And I just, you know, I wonder whether or not it was, maybe it was too much too soon for him. Maybe he just doesn't want to go a step beyond six furlongs. Um, but he, you know, some of sometimes really fast sprinters, they're not the same horse when they get eyeballed, when they can't just pop out to the front and, you know, you know, stay in front for, for the whole race and, and not really have anybody ever breathing down their neck or looking them in the eye. I think that a lot of times there'll be, there'll be different horses when they do get that pressure. So we'll see, you know, his first three starts, he was too fast for everybody he lined up against. That's not going to be the case all the time. He was too fast early in the, in the Malibu, but really just had, had nothing in the stress. So it's going to be interesting to see where he shows up next. Um, and, and if he's able to bounce back, because I thought it was as the, the, two stories of the race as, as good as Charlatan was, I thought it was a pretty bad performance by Nashville. And, and, you know, it's obviously early days for him, but I, I think that that's something that's, he's going to need to bounce back from um, on the life is good front. I think, you know, even though I'm, I'm skeptical about him derby wise, I think there there's, you know, there's enough context to say that he's really good 
whether or not it's, you know, shorter or whatever, beyond the one-on-one buyer he got, um, beyond the, the, the obvious speed he shows. If you look at his debut race and the horses that have come back to run, the runner up in that race ran a 71 buyer behind life is good, came back and ran an 88 buyer graduating next time out. And then the fourth horse, uh, Roman Centurion, who, who uh, I think he ran a 65 behind life is good. He came back on Sunday and I made him a TDN rising star. Um, he got an 80 buyer in his, in his uh, maiden win on Sunday, but it really was, it was visually more than anything. He was caught wide on both turns and he did, the race did fall apart a little bit in his lap. There was a fast pace, but he really was finishing and really motored home. So I think, you know, as time goes on, we're going to see that that race was super, super live. Um, so that, that flatters life is good, obviously. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. This is our life's work. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Learn about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. All right, so we had the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act, the Heiser, the HESA, depending on how you want to how you want to say it, um, pass last Monday night. It was late Monday night when the uh, coronavirus relief package was signed into law. Um, so that was that was kind of a formality once it was in, once it was uh, included in that bill. Um, but obviously, obviously, it's a big deal for the industry. There's a lot still to be determined. Uh, it's not going to go into effect until July 2022. So there's a lot. Of, there's a good amount of time to figure out how this thing is going to work. Um, we're going to talk to the president of the Jockey Club, uh, Jim Gagliano, in a little bit and ask try to ask him questions and, and get a, a better handle on, on how this thing is going to shake out. Um, but the main thing I think that everybody is talking about and the, the main sticking point is how this is going to be paid for. And it's going to, it's going to be pretty expensive once you bring in USADA to do all the drug testing. There was a, there was an article this week in the TDN about, you know, how much exactly it's going to cost. And it seems like it's going to be upwards of $20 million to do all this testing at least. Um, and then you all, you also, you also have to, to pay people um, on the horse racing integrity and safety authority. It's going to, it's going to get expensive pretty quickly. I think and this is not an industry that, has a lot of spare money lying around. It's just, you know, we, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're scrimping as, as it is these days. And, and, you know, the main thing I think that the main takeaway and Bill wrote about this a little bit is, is that there are two own two groups that you can't really tax any more than they, than they've been taxed already in this industry. And that's owners and horse players. And I'm going to stand up for horse players because I think there are some owners who can afford to, to pay a little more, but that, that gets tricky because most owners, you know, I think are, are barely scraping by, but you know, you can't raise takeout. You just, you, you can't do it. I, I, I'm worried that this is going to be, you know, kind of the de facto way to, to pay for this was, is to increase um, the pricing on, on betting horses. And it's just, you can't, you can't do it. People are, are squeezed to the last drop as it is. And I'm like, you know, I'm obviously an advocate for, for racing and for playing the horses, but I'm like kind of, at my wits end with the takeout I mean, and all the stuff that comes with, with betting the horses. And it's just, if you, if you jack it up anymore, you're going to lose a lot of customers and then you're going to be in a bigger hole than you were before this thing happened. So there's no easy answers. I'm curious to get to get Bill and John's thoughts about how this might be paid for. But my, my thought would be that you, you just can't take it out of horse players pockets. We're bleeding money enough as it is. Well, I mean, first of all, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the last place they should take the money is from the horse players because they are the most important segment of this game with them and owners together, one and one A. And horse players are getting blood dry as it is. But the problem, Joe, as you said, is, you know, where is the money going to come from? There's no group in horse racing where you could say, oh, you guys are doing great. You can pay for it. 
Horse players aren't. Owners certainly aren't. Racetracks, you know, they don't generally make any money running racing. You know, it's different with casinos, but you're not going to take it, obviously, from the casino money. So how is this all going to break down? And we'll get more from Jim Gagliano when we talk to him. But it looks like what they're going to do is they're going to first figure out how much this is going to cost. And that's just anybody's guess at this point. I mean, I wouldn't even begin to know what kind of number to throw out. And then they're going to go to divide it up by each individual state based on how many, uh, how much racing there is in that state. So Pennsylvania with three racetracks is going to have to pay more than Arkansas with one racetrack, Oakland. I'm guessing that the states are going to then say, maybe we have to have a starter fee. So is that $100 for a horse to start? Is it $150 a horse? This is all just general speculation. But the states have to come up with a way of how they're going to pay for it. And I think the most the easiest way to do that is just have some sort of starter fee. But, you know, can you and I'd like to see what John has to say about this as an owner. I mean, even a, a, a good stable with some very good horses like his, could they afford to pay two hundred dollars every single time they start a horse? So, John, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it off to you and see what you have to say about that. Yeah, you know, Bill, this this was actually brought to my attention uh, a little while ago about um, hey, how are you going to pay for this? Uh, you know, very important bill, and and obviously a ruling. Um, obviously, it's something that the industry needs, and it's something that the industry um, has been lacking for years and years and years. And I even went through in in anticipation of of our interview today with Jim Gagliano. I went through actually some of the transcripts of the Jockey Club. Uh, meetings, the roundtable meetings they have every year. And as recently as, as 2018, um, in that roundtable conference, one of the issues that um, that the McKinsey report came out with was the fact that owners and horse players are losing confidence in the integrity of the game. And that was in 2018. Um, so if you want to you know, say, well, we're fixing the integrity issue, but oh, it's going to cost you a tax in essence to do it. Um, you know, some people may be okay with it, but but I think the vast majority doesn't want to have, you know, another governmental agency have their hand in, in their pocket. Um, so a starter fee, even if it's, if it's a minor one, like a couple hundred dollars, that greatly changes the, uh, the the landscape for a lot of these outfits and a lot of these owners, um, where they say, maybe I don't want to run the horse again, um, you know, and 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 then it's going to get to the point of, well, I'm going to enter my horse, I'm going to look at it, and if I'm 10, 15, 20 to one, and really don't feel like I have a chance, then I'm going to scratch, and and it's going to cause havoc for the racing, um, you know. Uh, offices of all the respective racetracks, because they're not going to know, are we going to, we entered 12, are six going to run, um, are eight going to run, and then it's going to affect the product and then people aren't going to bet on it and, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't know if that's necessarily the best way to do it. Um, I, it the, the cynic in me says that depending on who is going to be in the roundtable discussion um, as far as how to pay for this is going to, uh, you know, greatly affect who gets taxed for it. Um, I, I say with all sincerity, if it's a bunch of people that are farm owners um, and breeders, then the racing operations are going to be the ones that pay for it. And if it's a racing operation group um, that dominates the, the roundtable discussion, then it's going to be the farms and the sales companies um, that are going to take the brunt of the tax. But overall, the entire industry has to realize that Heise is really important to the to the to the longevity of the sport and the integrity of the sport um, because we've proven time and time again and we've talked about it over and over again on this podcast that we just don't have the wherewithal or the interest or the desire to self-regulate. So this is what happens when you can't self-regulate your own industry. Government comes in and it costs you money because you guys, me included, as part of as part of the the racing product, um, weren't able to kind of police yourselves. And you get taxed for it now. Yeah, um, I just I don't know. There's there's so much big money in this in this industry that it's going to be a hard sell to ask horse players to take another hit on top of you know the the already exorbitant takeout they're paying you know on a on a on a regular basis. I understand that you know uh, owning horses is also and owning farms can also still be a you know an, an economically tough business, but there's a, there is so much big money and so many billionaires in this, in this industry that, you know, it's going to have to, it's going to have to come from the top. I think otherwise you're going to lose a lot of the bread and butter of your industry, which is the horse players. And I'm, I'm, I'm ex interested to talk to Jim um, about that and see, see what he says, see what his, his thoughts are going forward. But I just think, you know, he, he, it's, it would be a disaster to, to take it out of the horse players pockets. And, and you know, I don't know that, 
that racing would really recover from that. You're hanging on to your customer base by a thread as it is. Um, it's got, it's got to come from somewhere else. I'm not, uh, I don't, I don't have any great ideas at the moment. Bill had an interesting idea about, uh, about breakage. Um, now, now breakage, if, if you're unfamiliar is, you know, this is, this is a, like a hidden tax on horse players already as it is. Um, breakage is the, the payouts are rounded down to the nearest either 20, 10 cents or 20 cents. So if you, if you bet a horse and the horse wins and should pay four dollars and 58 cents you're going to get 440 back now that adds up over the time that those 18 cents you know over all of the the winning wagers across the country for the whole year that adds up to millions and millions of dollars now there are other sources that that breakage that the breakage money is getting um sent to but i just I thought that was that was an interesting idea by Bill and and and, and you know kind of an outside the box thought because you know it's not going to be easy to to come up with a a, a paying a, a a way to pay for this but you know there 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 is bloat in this industry you just got to find it and I felt like that was one of the places but you know there might be there might be too many people that are benefiting from that right now that aren't willing to give up that handout which is basically what it is a handout on the backs of horse players all right so we had some big news um we we teased this at the at our in our final 2020 show we, we said we were interested to see what the final 2020 handle numbers would be and they were released yesterday by equibase um it's 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 a remarkable thing that wagering was somehow down only 0.98 percent in 2020. And I think that's one of the good news stories of, of horse racing in 2020 and going forward. The total handle was $10.925 billion in 2020 compared to $11.033 billion in, in 2019. So essentially flat. Um, the big difference was in wagering per race day because there were fewer race days. Um, there were 3,302 race days in 2020 compared to 4,425 in 2019. So that's a big drop off 25.38%. So average wagering per weight per, per race day was 3.3 million compared to 2.4 million. Now that's a huge, huge difference. You know, and you could say, you know, people are going to bet, people were just betting the same money that they were going to bet anyway. And they, they, you know, they had this, amount of money budgeted to, to wager. Um, and they just had fewer days to do it. But I think that, that kind of, that oversells the, uh, the forethought of, of gamblers to think, to have this, the, the set budget, you know, for the year and, and, and to never stray from it. Um, no matter what, I think it, it's, it's generally more of a, you know, go by, by feel as the year goes on type of thing. Um, but you know, that's a, it's a, regardless of that, regardless of whether it was just the same money divvied up differently, the fact that wagering was essentially flat when overall you have economic conditions that are the worst since the Great Depression. Now, obviously, things are going to get better um, once the pandemic starts to wane. But, you know, to have that kind of economic downturn and to still have wagering be essentially flat in 2020 is a big, big deal potentially for horse racing. And we're going to, it'll be interesting to see, you know, once as the calendar turns into 2021 to see the first quarter numbers in 2021, the first half numbers in 2021. But I just, I don't, you know, we, we, we love, we don't love to be pessimists, but we're forced to be pessimists sometimes on the show. I don't see how you can be pessimistic about, about these numbers. Um, I'm curious to see what, what Bill has to say. Well, I mean, first of all, it's not bad news. That that's obviously, I mean, down 0.98 percent, less than one percent. Uh, you, you can't look at that and say, oh, in any way, shape, or form, this is bad news for racing. But I, Joe, I, I still don't know what it means. And does it mean that that racing picked up all these new customers? And you know, maybe it picked them up when the NBA, the NHL, uh, and Major League Baseball wasn't going. People had didn't have anything to watch on TV. They watched horse racing on TV. They didn't have anything else to bet on. We're not going to know that until 2021 numbers start to come in. So if 2021 numbers grow, and you know something significant, not one percent, but you know seven, eight, nine, ten percent, then we're going to have the answer. Yes. One of the uh, silver linings to the cloud of 2020 was that horse racing picked up some new customers and the product grew. But I'm not convinced that it's not just 
smaller slices of the pie or bigger slices of the pie that you do have this money out there. And it's not so much that horse players plan their budgets or anything like that, but you know, on a Saturday afternoon, if there's 10 tracks running, are you going to bet more than if there are eight tracks running? No, you're just going to bet the same amount of money, but it's going to be divided up among the eight tracks or the many tracks that you're betting on. So, you know, let's see what happens here. Hopefully it's really good news and it could be really good news for horse racing, but you know, there's just too many factors, too many unknowns for 2020, too many balls up in the air. I think for anybody to really to be able to come up with a concrete answer of what this, this meant. Guys, I, I got to look at this as a half empty kind of, kind of situation um, where, you know, we were the only game in town. We were literally the only game in town for months and months and months. And we couldn't convince more people to bet more on our sport. I mean, I understand there's a pandemic and COVID and people lose their jobs. And, and, and those are all very legitimate factors, you know, when, when you're analyzing this. But come on, there was no way for any of these, you know, gamblers to bet on anything else other than horse racing. And we're flat. To me, that that's kind of a negative. I mean, you know, people told me years and years and years, you know, decades ago that the only three businesses that are recession proof are bars, churches and racetracks. And, you know, this, the, 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 the teeth of COVID put us in basically a, a recession like situation and we were flat or maybe down a little bit to me, that doesn't bode well, because I think that these gamblers, you know, took their money and went to football when football reopened and went to basketball when, when college basketball reopened. And, and, and now I think we're going to start seeing our numbers come back to the levels that they were at before. So we as an industry had an opportunity to capture new fans and capture new people by literally being the only game in town. And we didn't. Jesus. I, you know, I, I try to bring a little ray of sunshine into the show every once in a while. And I just, you can't do it with these guys. They, they, they always find the, the negative. Uh, Joe, I gotta, I gotta tell you in my years of being a certified financial planner, you know, I would, I would always like, to, you know, tell people, okay, you need to have a certain amount of money for like, you know, your, 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 your essentials, certain amount of money for a vacation fund, certain amount of money for entertainment, for, for gambling. I think, I don't know if people were that, you know, savvy or, or conscious of what they were doing, but like you guys said before, they were probably betting, you know, the same amount in 2020. But if, if ESPN, the Ocho threw up cockroach racing and made it wagerable, um, you know, I think people would bet on that, especially if, if they thought of, you know, one of the bugs was juiced. I don't know. I mean, I can only speak to I can only speak to my my own experience, but I definitely bet less in 2020 just because you know you got to be a little bit more careful with your money when there's something when there's something as catastrophic as the pandemic happening. So I I don't know. I mean, that's just me. That's just anecdotal. But I have to think there were a lot of people that were not being as you know you know as not, they weren't being spendthrifts the way they normally are um, on, on horse racing. I I don't know. I. I I find it hard to believe that this is a negative story. Now we're, we're going to learn more as, as 2021 moves on and we get more handle numbers for this year. But I don't know. I, I disagree with John. I don't think there's, there's any way to look at this as a negative. I think at, at, at worst it's a wash. Um, but there's the, 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 the discussion to be had is whether or not we gain new customers. And that's a hard thing to figure out. You know, there's no there's no data, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, maybe with with ADWs, you could you could you know call up Naira Betts and see if they they got a bunch of new signups or whatever. But other than that, I don't I don't I don't know how easy it is to figure out how many new people are betting on the game. And then obviously, that's that's the the biggest metric of all, whether or not we're we're just maintaining the existing customer base or expanding it. Um, but I just I would have you know if you had told me at the beginning of the pandemic you know, horse racing wagering is going to be essentially flat in 2020. I would have said, how, how is that possible? How are we not down 10, 15% because of everything that's, that's going on in the world? So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with John in that, you know, we don't, I don't think we capitalized as much as we should have on being the only game in town there for a while. But I think there's also a lot of good news from the handle numbers in 2020 and it's, you know, we're going to get more context later this year, but uh, that's 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 what I get for being the ray of sunshine on this show. <laughs> Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class sources and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. 
fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. All right, so in this week's edition of Shady Trainer that was given a ninth life in racing, we have the illustrious return of Marcus Vitale. Um, if you don't know who Marcus Vitale was, he's a guy who was banned uh, for, I think, at least uh, four months at, at, at uh, Gulfstream. He was banned for an entire year in Delaware um, for grabbing something out of the fridge when they were raiding his barn and, and then running away which uh, sounds like so, like something like Bugs Bunny would do. Um, but he, so he's, he's back, you, you know, just like, just, just like other guys in racing, you can always, you can always find a, a, a jurisdiction or a racing commission that doesn't really care who you are or what your past is. You can always have a ninth or 10th chance um, in racing. And Marcus Vitale has resurfaced at Turf Paradise in Arizona. Um, so this is obviously a, 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 thing, a, a drum that we beat a lot in racing about how, you know, there's no, there's no coordination or cooperation between different racing commissions to keep guys like this out of the game. Now he was just, he was actually just in the news recently getting another guy ruled off the grounds. Like that's how toxic he is that Wayne Potts was supposedly allegedly the, the program trainer for him in Maryland and they rule in Sal Sinatra, a friend of the show ruled Wayne Potts off just for being associated with, with Marcus Vitale. And yet a couple months later, Marcus Vitale himself under his name is, is now racing horses again. And it's, I feel like it's a broken record. Like you laugh, but it's not funny. You know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's, it's groundhog day. I feel like in racing when it comes to these things and um, it's just, and you only you only get so many chances in sports normally in other sports at least the uh, just look at the quarterback of the Washington football team Dwayne Haskins he was he was in a strip club during COVID and they cut him like a week later and this is this is something that happens in other sports you have a very very short leash to to demonstrate that you are responsible enough and upstanding enough to be part of the sport and racing we just. We don't have we don't have the people who have that kind of integrity to say no. Sorry, you've done all of these other things. We don't want you on our grounds. Uh, Bill reported this yesterday. I'm wondering if he has any further thoughts. Yo, what is there to say at this point? I mean, I, I mean, honestly, I, I mean, you know, I'd like to go wax eloquent about this situation, but yeah, broken record, Groundhog's Day. Um, Look, everybody deserves a second chance. Maybe everybody deserves a third chance. But this guy was asking for about his 37th chance. And someone said, yes, sure. Come on in. Train horses there. Uh, no, he should not be able to, to race horses. And we'll, uh, a year from now on show 209, we'll be talking about Trainer X coming back after being suspended 14 times at, at Track B. Of course we will. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. It, it, but it is amazing that the racing just – perpetuates this situation and lets these guys who, you know, what do you ever want to call them? Shady, but people that, you know, really should not be participating in the game and they do come back. So uh, again, um, you know, let's, let's just say it is what it is. And, you know, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. And, and here's the thing, you know, I was looking on, on Twitter last night, um, you know, it, People, me included, were actually tweeting out to Turf Paradise saying, really, is this really the look that you want to have to <clears throat> allow a guy like this um, into, you know, embrace him into your, your training core? Um, and, and really, they got they got no response. And finally, somebody from the PR department said, hey, you can't really yell at me. I'm just the guy putting the tweet out there. Um, I'm a lowly guy in, in the PR. You know, talk to management. And, 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 you know, he's not wrong in that sense, but somebody from management should at least come out and have a statement of either saying, hey, you know, we went through our due diligence process and we felt that he paid his sentence and, and his penance and therefore we're giving him another chance because in America you're allowed to have 
you know, second, third, fifth, 18th chances. Um, you know, I remember Bill, you'll, you'll back me up on this. There was a pitcher, Steve Howe, who had a substance abuse problem, you know, pitched for the Dodgers and the Yankees. And, and he had a, you know, a plethora because he could still throw it 99 miles an hour. And, and, you know, teams wanted to have that kind of talent on, on it. And they knew the baggage they were getting. I don't know if turf paradise really sees Vitaly as such a tremendously, you know, a tremendous trainer that they need to have him as a name, um, you know, for their racetrack. Because really all they're getting right now is controversy. Um, and, and I even went so far as to pull the actual Arizona State licensing um, questionnaire for owners and trainers. And right here on the second page, there's a question that says, has your racing license ever, and it's underlined, I'm not making this up, it's underlined, ever been denied, suspended, or revoked? Yes or no? So he either willingly, fraudulently put no, and they said, we're rubber stamping it because there's no, you know, yeses, uh, affirmatives on the questionnaire, or he put yes, and the Arizona, you know, licensing department failed in their due diligence to actually look up and see whether or not, you know, what, what the issues were. And if they did, they would have had to have had a hearing in order to grant him his license. So somewhere, somebody screwed up, either the trainer wantingly put, you know, um, you know, false information down, which I don't think he did. I, you know, I mean, he, he probably did a lot to the horses, but I'm sure he went into this going, well, they're probably going to check me out. So I better just come clean and put yes. Um, and if he did put yes, then Arizona dropped the ball by actually granting him a license without having any kind of um, hearing and any kind of criminal background check um, on it. And if they didn't, then they need to come out and say, we did our due diligence and we think this guy is a, is, is a, a plus and a pro part of turf paradise racing. Embrace it then. Yeah, I mean, this is, and this is where, where Bill's reporting is so crucial and where like us talking about this is, is a big deal because otherwise, you know, obviously there's a social media backlash, but there's gotta be, there's, there's gotta be some kind of public outrage about this, about this kind of thing. And, you know, we, we, we I feel like we go through it all the time with, with just, you know, replace the trainer's name of a guy who should not be around horses and just gets chance after chance. I said it before, but it feels like the only guy who really got punished after, through all these years is Rick Dutro. And even then there are some people who are like, bring Rick Dutro back, but like everyone else, you just get, you just get a slap on the wrist, spin them around and point them towards a different racing jurisdiction. And it's, it's, it's a new day for Marcus Vitale. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's not good. Not good. It's racing's version of pin the tail on the donkey. You're right. We, gotta, we have to do better. And throw them back into a different jurisdiction. We got to do better. I feel like we had a graphic for that. We have to do better. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is a guy we've been trying to get on for a while. We're thrilled to finally have him on, the president and the COO of the Jockey Club, Jim Gagliano. Thanks so much for joining us. That's my pleasure. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Happy Great to have you. Looking forward to this this conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll start with uh, the big news of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act. Obviously, a, a watershed moment for racing going forward, I think, if, if it's handled correctly. But a lot of people are talking about how it's going to be paid for. Um, and I don't expect you to have all the answers because it's it's a it's a complex discussion. I was sure. saying I think it should never it should not come out of horse players' pockets at all. But what would be your recommendation and your ideas for how we pay for this thing? Well, I would agree with you, Joe. I, I, I don't think it should come out of the horse players' pockets. Um, every state funds its regulation differently. And the, the problem that we faced when we were considering uh, that matter is there's really no one size fits all that we could push down to the states. The most important thing we wanted to do is make sure we captured first the current um, expenses, the current costs, and that those are brought forward. Uh, after that, the authority will work with each state and through its racing commission to determine what the number is. Um, I suggest, you know, the, the simplest way is to share it between the tracks and the horsemen. Um, but, you know, honestly, uh, there's a, a lot of details to be considered. Um, that's a very simple answer. Um, again, every state funds it a little bit differently, so it's going to be um, unique to each state. Hey, Jim, thanks for joining us and thanks for the yeah. insight. 
the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act. So you just said something that I thought was uh, very noteworthy, that the Jockey Club really does not want to see the money come from horse players, which is great news for all horse players and the three of us here on there. But if you take the money from the tracks and the horsemen, let's for, uh, not deal with the tracks at this point. Do you see that as some sort of per start fee? And on top of that, well, horse players can't afford it. Owners can't afford it either. We all know that because owning a racehorse is a very uh, difficult proposition if you're trying to make money. So, you know, you, just your general thoughts on what kind of uh, burden it might be if there is a start fee put in and owners do have to pay for it. Well, let's start with what we're trying to get accomplished here. And this bill will bring a, a once in a hundred years change in the way the sport's regulated. Uh, you know, the advantages are it'll be a level playing field. We don't have that now. You know, we've seen from the indictments, from other uh, uh, other things, just read your social media, lots of concerns about it not being a level playing field. And it's our honest view that in 18 months when this new authority is established and USADA is put in the enforcement role that, that is designated for them, that we'll see a significant change. Um, some of those owners that have been running second for a long time are gonna have a better chance. Um, so it, it, it's an expense, no, no doubt. Um, I'm certainly sympathetic. Uh, we put out our numbers yesterday. While handle uh, was within one percent of the previous year, purses are way down, and you know that is that is an issue. But we think this is an expense the industry has to has to make. Um, uh, I, I don't know who's in New Jersey today. Um, I guess John and, and Bill probably are. Let's take Mammoth Park. Um, they had about five thousand starts last year. Our estimates back in 2015, when we looked at this with McKinsey and USADA and a couple state regulators to understand what the costs could potentially be. And again, this is a few years ago and it needs to be updated. Uh, it, it was between 30 and $45 a start. Let's just use that as a, as a number. So it's a couple hundred thousand dollars um, in New Jersey if that's split between the horseman and the track. To me, it doesn't sound like a terrible burden. And, and Jim, you, know, you, you, you bring up a good point with, with the McKinsey report. Um, it was something that, that I read with great interest because um, they came in after years and years of, of study and basically said, hey, you know, the health of the industry is at risk right now. And I give you and, and the Jockey Club a tremendous amount of credit for being proactive and trying to resuscitate certain parts of the industry and, and trying to, to get us back on course um, in order to make this a viable industry, you know, for, for our kids and, and generations to come. Um, and one of the things that, that the McKinsey Report also came out with was they talked about, you know, the integrity of the sport. Um, with regard to owners and, and gamblers and, and people just losing faith in, in, in our business. Aside from Haiza, are there other um, plans or other things that the Jockey Club is going to address or, or, or sees it in their radar that, that needs to be um, discussed you know, over the coming years? Well, I'm sure there, there, there's plenty. Uh, how we market the sport um, along with other professional sports was something that they identified uh, in the opportunity of television, which... Um, thank goodness we took that, uh, we, the industry took uh, that advice and uh, during this pandemic uh, to see the amount of uh, live uh, uh, televised hours of, of horse racing has been a godsend. Um, it, we talked about scheduling, um, you know, uh, Bill, you know, from our early days working together, every Saturday was a big day. Uh, you know, now we, we need to look at race, racing schedules, weekly schedules, seasonal schedules look differently. And we need to, to um, put the product in uh, a place where it can have the best, uh, we can be showcased best for ADWs. Um, but other areas of, uh, you know, clearly Heise is going to um, put uh, USADA and uh, into a role. There are now rule, uh, rules and, and um, uh that will be in place that will, you know, change the sport, we believe, but back to the investigations. Um, that's something that racing has not done very well over the last bunch of years. And I anticipate that the Jockey Club will continue to invest uh, in those kind of resources uh, to make sure that um, the things that are, we don't want to happen in our sport don't happen. 
A little bit of a follow-up question on that um, when it comes to drug enforcement in the industry. I think oh, a big problem, and I think you would agree, a lot of people would agree in the industry, is that there are so many splinter groups and so many different factions. You guys are one of the unifying groups in racing, but obviously you have limited power. How do you think that your role, what do you think your role is right now in terms of cleaning up the sport? And how do you think, if at all, it'll change once the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act goes into effect? Well, it won't change uh, uh, the general policy, which is we're going to do what we think is best for the for the sport, for the, the betterment of the racing and the breeding industries. So we'll continue to make those investments every year. Um, we'll, we'll, we certainly are happy to see HISA now made law and signed by the president. So that's a that's a big um, burden that's now going to to uh, come into play. And um, but back to investigations and things like that, we'll continue to invest in, in those kind of activities. Hey, Jim, uh, before you came on, the three of us were discussing a particular incident, a particular person racing in Marcus Vitale. And I'm not sure how much you're aware of the story. So uh, forgive me if I'm telling you something you already know, but I'm sure you know about his background. Many, many suspensions, including a year suspension in Delaware. Uh, He resurfaced just the other day at Turf Paradise after being effectively out of racing for a year and a half. All three of us came to the same conclusion. This just isn't right. Someone like this has proven that they really should not, in our opinion, be someone who should be allowed to take part in the sport. So sort of a two-part question. Uh, Could you just reflect on racing's inability to permanently do away with some of the people that are uh, breaking the rules time and time again? And in any way, could this change with USADA and Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act? Yeah, definitely. So uh, what's been the limiting factor is each of the states um, have their own racing commissions. They, they can only um, govern what happens in their particular state. There may be, they may attempt to uh, have reciprocity, but that's not always the case. Uh, now under a new federal system, a new umbrella, um, that, that those things will be looked at for the entire United States, not just in New Jersey or Arizona uh, specifically. So it's a, it's a dawn of a new day. Yeah, no, it, 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 it futures bright in, in that sense, uh, you know, as far as having a, a unified body to oversee, you know, some of the rules and regulations, because obviously as an industry, we, we weren't able to do that. Um, and and right. one of the rules actually that, that the Jockey Club implemented this year um, in June was the, the, the 140 mayor rule, um, which I think we all agree, Jim, that we needed to have something to curb the inbreeding that was going on in the industry. Um, it, a lot of people have asked us, you know, why 140 was the magic number. And I know you guys did tremendous studies with, with geneticists and, and scientists to figure out, you know, the, the actual number itself. Can you give us kind of a behind the curtain look as to why 140 as opposed to 40, which is which was the magic number when you and I got into the business, you know, 30 sure, years ago, or, or 250, which some of the farms are doing now? I'm not going to go too much into what the, the stewards um, deliberated specifically. I'll just say that they you know, they had available to them uh, lots of public research that that you've all had an uh, opportunity to examine. Uh, they've had a chance. They had a chance to get um, months and months of comment uh, from you know many many uh, breeders, professionals, and they weighed all that. And on top of that, they they had a chance to look at the data. You know, the actual the numbers, and that's that's the number they came up with. Uh, they voted unanimously to support it, and that is that is the uh, requirement now. Is, I'm just curious, just to jump in for a second, when, when you watch a race and, and it's won by a horse that, that is like a complete outcross, like a California Chrome or, or something like that, are you rooting for a horse like that just to kind of no. help, the, you know, <laughs> kind no, of I, 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 awesome I, I, the, 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 the gene pool a little bit? Uh, I, that, that does not go into my calculus. So. <laughs> Whatever I do, it's probably the wrong choice. So <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I wanted to ask, because you mentioned you mentioned marketing the sport a little bit before, and you also mentioned handle. We talked about it before you came on, that it was, I, at least I thought John was being negative. I thought it was a pretty good sign that raise, that handle was basically flat in, in 2020, considering the economic conditions. But I'm wondering if you guys have done any research or any studies um, to try to determine whether or not we did gain any new customers in 2020 when we did have the, the, the spotlight to ourselves. And if not, what do you think we need to do going forward to increase the customer base? So anecdotally, talking to uh, colleagues in the sport that were responsible for ADW business, uh, clearly they, they were signing up many more customers than they had in the past. And 
it, it's interesting the way racetracks um, ma- marketed in the past. It was really um, there was broadcast ads and billboards and things like that, but they really didn't do a good job of capturing the data about horse players. There was there was this belief, well, they don't want their information to be shared. Well, now uh, all of those new customers that signed into ADWs, all that da- data is captured. And um, just like any other um, new marketing methods, it's using that data, trying to understand what, what you like, what you don't like, what you'd be attracted to. So I, I think it, it, there's some, some tremendous opportunities uh, with that new digital uh, marketing opportunity. And when we get back to opening racetracks and, and getting back to live attendance at you know, places like Monmouth, which you know, uh, still to this day uh, attract crowds and make new fans, I think there, there's you know, a couple of, couple of good uh, things happening here. Hey, Jim, I wanna, I wanna go back to the Horse Race Integrity and Safety Act. And one of the interesting things about it was for several years, it didn't appear to be really going anywhere inside Washington. And that all changed when Mitch McConnell came out and they had that press conference at Keeneland where he supported it. But prior to that, the conventional wisdom was that McConnell was not in favor of this because Churchill Downs was not in favor of it and McConnell was gonna not cross Churchill Downs. Then all of a sudden Churchill Downs is on board, McConnell is on board, and then the thing just flies through. Well, they had some bumps in the road, but not a lot. The thing flies through Congress and is passed. Behind the scenes, what's your understanding what happened there? How did we go from the situation where McConnell apparently wasn't in favor of it, that meant the bill was going nowhere, to where he was in favor of it and Churchill Downs was in favor of it as well? Well, I think if uh, if you recall that uh, press conference at Keeneland when he was, when uh, Leader McConnell spoke, uh, he referred to reading an article in the Washington Post, which questioned whether or not thoroughbred racing has a future. And as a Kentuckian, and as a, a follower of the sport and, a, and, and recognizing its importance to the Commonwealth, uh, he was disturbed by that. Um, he, he asked us and others to come together and see if they could compromise. And you mentioned Churchill Downs. I give them all the credit in the world uh, for coming to the table in the way they did. I think in the end, the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act is a far better bill than, than the initial one. It goes further, it does more, uh, it's, it has more base, it, it is based on a certain set of rules that are understood. And it empowers uh, USADA specifically to be the enforcement agency. Uh, so it, it, was, it was a coming together moment uh, for a lot of us in recognizing that um, we needed to make changes. And I credit Leader McConnell and his um, incredibly capable staff for uh, being the catalysts, but I also commend everybody who worked um, you know, basically through the pandemic uh, and came up with the compromises, including animal welfare groups, uh, including racetracks, uh, racing organizations, um, associations. It was a it was a group effort. And uh, you know, today you look at U.S. politics and how, and all the discord. It, it's pretty cool to think that that so many groups came together to support this act. And uh, I, I think it was a proud day for the sport. No question about it. And it's something that, that we've needed as an industry for, for years and years to come. And, and I don't have any other questions, Jim, other than to thank you for, you know, for your leadership and, and for the Jockey Club being um, one of the unifying groups um, within, the, within the industry. And, and we just we need more collaboration. If, if there's a silver lining in any of this COVID situation is that 2020 racetracks came together to work on calendars and boards and groups that normally were at odds with each other came together. And, uh, you know, we need more of that. So, so we all appreciate, you know, all of us in the industry appreciate your leadership with this. Well, it's, uh, it, it's a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, that came together. So, um, we, we, we all appreciate that. And we, we thank you for your comments. All right. So, so we're, we're thankful for Jim's time and he's got to get out of here, but he has, he has one thing that he wanted to show us about our friend, Bill Finley. 1987, Bill, uh, the Red wow. Bank uh, steeplechase uh, event where you were the paddock judge and I was the observer. <laughs> Look at the, that. Suit I'm in the closet Bill. yesterday. Very nice. Very nice. I've never, seen, I've never seen Bill wear anything but a hoodie or a zip up <laughs> sweater. <laughs> we're pretty sharp that day. Yep. <laughs> oh boy. So, that's that's back when Bill was a real turf rider. Now he's <laughs> now he's just a talking head. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jim. Thank you so much for the time, and thank you guys at the Jockey Club for all your hard work. And and we look forward to the, to hearing more from you guys the rest of the year and in the future. Thanks, guys. Happy New Year again.
Thanks, Thanks, Jim. Jim. Appreciate it. Well, you, Jim. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Jim Gagliano will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So this week or last week, this week it's 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 been announced. Uh, I had the distinct honor of being given an Eclipse Award um, for my yeah for <laughs> John's face. I was, John's the only one that didn't know, so I was waiting for that. Um, so yeah, uh, last year around Belmont time, I did a story about about New York and COVID and, and overcoming all that and and you know kind of beating back the pandemic in order to have sports again and have have Belmont again and Belmont Stakes Day. And it was it was a it was a really personal story. It's probably one of the most personal stories I've ever written and I was really proud of it. But then it got even better because Patty and her incredible team of editors worked on a video version of it. And if you haven't watched it, you should go watch it right now. I'll put the link in my, in my Twitter bio. It's 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 beautiful. It's 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 50 50 to make you cry. I got I to gotta admit, I got a lot of DMs about people having you know emotional reactions to it. And that was that to me was the most rewarding thing, because it was it was the story of my city and its, and its perseverance. And, you know, people from all over the country, you know, wrote wrote to me and, and talked about how much it moved them. So that was, you know, it was such a terrible year and such a tragic year that I was I was immensely grateful and, and, and humbled to be able to tell people this inspirational story of my city. So thankfully, everybody at the at the Eclipse Awards and Jim Cluxon and and everybody that's involved there saw it as good enough to be deserving of an Eclipse Award. And. I, I have to I have to hand it off to Patty right now because she is going to deflect the credit, but she and her team deserve at least fifty percent of the credit, if not more. I couldn't I couldn't disagree more. Could not disagree more. Um, we, we fleshed out Joe's words. They were uh, poignant, and they came at a moment in time where everybody needed them, and uh, as did the Belmont Stakes. So it was just a great, great moment in time. Um, I won't take credit away from Anthony Larocca, who's. Uh, always puts his heart into every edit. But Joe, I will deflect uh, almost entire credit back to you because it was your words that moved the whole thing. Thank you. I don't know. This is Patty's second Eclipse Award. So, you know, once is a fluke, two times is a trend. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if she and, and her team won another one going for it. But yeah, so just uh, I'm, I'm very humbled and very grateful. And it's something that I could not have even imagined a couple of years ago. You know, five years ago, I was doing some crappy perma freelance work at CBS Sports. And, you know, thankfully, Sue and, and everybody at TDN took a chance on me. And um, it's 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 worked out. You know, it's 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 an honor. And I'm, I'm happy to, to share it with you guys, especially John, to see that reaction. I, I, I got to tell you, with all sincerity, Joe, I mean, I know we joke around a lot on, on the show and, and we take you know shots at each other and, and it's all in good fun and out of love. I'm so proud of you. I'm genuinely, genuinely excited for everyone on the team. But most importantly, I, you know, again, I don't know if you know this, but I went to school as a journalism major. And I know that the things that I wrote from the heart, you know, I thought, you know, uh, went and, and, and transposed to the written word so much better. And when I read that piece of yours, you could just feel not only the love for the sport, but the love for the city. And it came out and, and it came through and, and, and just really was, you know, your best work that I've ever read. And, uh, and I'm just so proud that, that so many people out in the world have read it and commented to you and that it's getting the recognition, not only from people in the industry um, and outside of the industry, but also the recognition of an award, um, which, which, as you mentioned, is kind of secondary to, to the emotions that, that you felt and, and, you know, the feedback you got from people, but uh, you know, the, the, the award is well-deserved and, and I'm just so proud. And it's the first of, of many, I think from, from, for you and for uh, you know, Patty and her group and hopefully for, you know, for this show, but um, tremendous talent, as, as I've always said, you have tremendous talent and uh, I couldn't be happier for you. Um, and also for, you know, for everyone involved, it's just, it's an awesome, what an awesome day and, and an awesome accomplishment. They can never take that away from you. 
Hey, Joe, let me yeah, also, was, let me also ahead, add, congratulations. Uh, very well-deserved, terrific job. That was not only an Eclipse Award winner, it's one of the better pieces I've ever read about horse racing. And also I want to point out, too, John Green, DJ Stable, owned Jaywalk, an Eclipse Award winner. I have been fortunate enough to win an Eclipse Media Award as well. And you too now, Joe. So we have a clean sweep. All three of us, the current crew of the podcast, are Eclipse Award winners. I think that's something we can all be proud of. Eclipse Award winning TDN Writers Room is coming for all of us together. Um, but thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate the kind words. And that's that's very flattering from Bill, who's, who's one of the best uh, turf writers in, in America, for him to, to say that about my piece. So much appreciated uh, for, the, for the support, you guys. Um, I think of you as my older, older, older <laughs> brothers um, since we've been doing this show. So it's it's it's. It's it's gratifying to hear that from you guys, and 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 again, I got I got to thank Patty and her team. They were such such a big part of it. So, um, it's the link is in my bio for the for the piece, but I'm gonna toss it through the magic of Zoom podcast to the video that won the Eclipse Award. The history of Belmont Park, believe it or not, goes back over 350 years to when America itself wasn't even an idea yet. In 1665, New York's colonial governor, Richard Nichol, created New Market, a racetrack in Queens. It stood for over a century and proved so popular that even when the British were expelled in 1783, a thirst for horse racing lived on in the hearts of newly independent New Yorkers. Union Course sprouted up in 1821 and became the country's leading track. After that came Brighton Beach Race Course, which helped create the New York Institution of Amusement at Coney Island, the plants of Sheepshead Bay, Gravesend, Jerome Park, Aqueduct, and many others followed soon after as enterprises competing to satisfy the city's enduring racing fix. Then, on May 4, 1905, on a vast 400-acre expanse of land straddling the border of New York City and Long Island, Belmont Park opened. It was the very same land that Newmarket had sat atop hundreds of years earlier, but instead of a monument to British wealth and occupation, Belmont became an American treasure open for all to enjoy, which they did by the tens of thousands from all walks of the now industrialized city. The attendance, moreover, was not restricted to any one locality nor to any one class. The Bowery and the Avenue mingled in the surging democracy of the betting ring, said the New York Tribute in its coverage of opening day. The Belmont Stakes, previously run at Jerome Park and Morris Park, moved to its permanent home later that spring. And over the past 115 years, legends were born and furnished in that race and at that track. Man of War, Secretariat, Seattle Slough, American Pharaoh, all had to come prove their greatness by passing the test of the champion. Beyond the equine performances, the track has seen the ups and downs of modern history and weathered every storm. The anti-gambling laws that shut it down for two years soon after it opened, the Great Depression, World War II, but nothing could prepare Belmont or New York City for what was visited upon it this spring. New York City is a gateway to the rest of the world, but this year that role cost it dearly as flights from Europe packed with coronavirus infected travelers poured into the area by the thousands through March. It was a time bomb and by early April it had exploded. The biggest city in America screeched to a halt as everyone from the governor to the citizens turned their lives upside down and inside out to try to mitigate a horrendous pandemic that had already spread like wildfire. By mid-April, 800, 800 of our neighbors were dying every single day. The equivalent of all the lives we lost on 9-11 every four days. The plague was so ubiquitous and murderous that freezer trucks had to be parked outside of our hospitals because the morgues had so quickly reached their capacity of bodies. Constant sirens from ambulances reminded us of the hell we were in. Going to the grocery store, a chore we never thought twice about before, suddenly meant taking your life into your hands. All in all, over 20,000 people in the city have been killed. That's more than one in every 400 New York City residents. And it's not over. But one thing about New York City that makes it special, that you can't understand if you haven't lived here, is that we look out for each other. We've proven it time and time again. We bounced back from 9-11 with solidarity and generosity and went about our lives. When outsiders predicted chaos, we took care of our city during the 2003 blackout and again through Hurricane Sandy. 
Crime plummeted just when the city was at its most vulnerable. Yes, there's bluntness and rudeness, and if you're a tourist, you might have been bumped out of the way once or twice by a muttering New Yorker. But there's also compassion, understanding, and empathy. You can't survive in a city of 8 million people without all of those attributes. We stared down the greatest existential threat to a city that's faced far too many of them. The devastation has been incomprehensible. I personally lost a friend. But we tamed the beast far better than projected, and we flattened the curve. Again, because we looked out for each other and sacrificed. Today, New York, after being the epicenter of the global crisis, is in a far better position with the virus than most of America. Because of that, we get a summer. We get to live our lives with reasonable precautions for the next few months. And amid a sports desert, racing has been an oasis. So it's fitting that on the first day of that summer, we get the Belmont Stakes, the first major sports attraction in New York since the pandemic first descended upon us. In my high school days, I would sit alone in the sprawling Belmont grandstand on a random Wednesday and just soak in the sights of a game that I loved. The bucolic serenity of essentially having the country's biggest racetrack to myself helped me clear my mind and battle the anxiety of a teenager growing up in post 9-11 New York. It was peace at a time when life in New York didn't have much of it. So it makes sense on a personal level that that cavernous track returns to provide peace in times of distress for the city once more. And even though we may not have the roar of the crowd this year, that just amplifies the sounds unique to our sport even more. The thundering rumble of hooves, the exultations of jockeys, the reverberating ring of the starting gate. Whatever lies beyond the horizon, we have reason to be proud right now, even as we mourn. Communities are what get humans through hardship. And through that hardship, those communities become tighter knit. It's happened in racing, and it's certainly happened in New York City. So you'll excuse me if I shed a few tears when those horses come out to that track to the echo of booming horns and Frank Sinatra's timeless voice. We've all earned the opportunity to let it out. All right, so that's going to do it for the first TDN Writers Room of 2021, brought to you by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland January sale is next Monday, January 11th, through next Thursday, January 14th. You can visit january.keeneland.com for more details. I want to thank Bill Finley, Dr. John Green, and his lab coat, our Green Group guest of the week, Jim Cagliano, our producer, Patty Wolf, and our editors, Danny Cyber and Aliyah LaRocca. Thank you so much for watching. Please wear a mask. We'll see you next week.